welcome to Dave Cooper Live, where we bring you the people, the products, and the process, helping us all build it better. And did you know that Construction Safety Week and Mental Health Awareness Month both happen in May? So we are honored to have with us today someone who has significant experience in the construction sector, is an Amazon number one best-selling author, consultant, and highly sought-after speaker, Garrison Wynn. In a world where the only constant is change, today we discuss how managing that change can lead to improved safety and mental health. While rooted in psychology meets anthropology, this conversation is for non-academics. It's for the people who demand and deserve a safer work environment and for leaders who can deliver on that promise. Garrison has presented to literally almost all the Fortune 500s from Amazon to Walmart, many of which are the largest companies in the construction sector. He has a background in manufacturing, instrumentation, telecommunication, telecommunications, and is former Fortune 500 department head and former professional stand-up comedian. He is also a chemical plant explosion survivor who helps organizations communicate safety and more effectively. And with that said, we can't bring you any of these informative conversations without our sponsors. So before we bring Garrison on, let's give a big thank you to our sponsors for allowing us to continue all of these great conversations. Stream Modular, the only logistics company you need to transport your mods, pods, and panels. Our friends at Stream Modular are investing $50 million over the next 25 years to build the technology, solutions, and trailers needed to handle and transport the projects of today and meet the demands of tomorrow. Reach out to their team at StreamModular.com to discuss your next project. CombiLift is the largest global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers. A leader in long load handling solutions offering a free warehouse and site optimization design service. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes and from every industry maximize the capacity, safety, and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. A big thank you to Paul Short and the team at CombiLift for helping us all to build it better. Visit them at combilift.com. Brave Control Solutions, where offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry and powered by CAD to Fab and Turnkey Solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembly, kitting, and storage. Learn more at thinkbrave.com. All right, again, thanks to all of our sponsors. We cannot continue to bring all of these awesome people to the forefront so you can meet them, use them in your organizations, and learn about how we can make construction better for everybody and safer. And that's what today's topic is about. So let's jump into it and let's bring Garrison onto the show. Garrison, my friend, how are you? Doing great, doing great. How are you, Dave? And I'm always doing great, especially I get to talk to like great people all the time. I have you on the show again, which is amazing. Garrison, it's been over a year, I think, since you've been on the show last time. Why don't you just take a brief second and give everybody your your two-minute elevator pitch, and then let's jump into this important topic. Uh, Last 28 years, I've been speaking at conventions all uh, over the world. I think I did 90 or so last year, everybody. And uh, so uh, I was an instrumentation person uh, back in the day, corporate America guy, was a pro stand-up for a while back in the day. And uh, I really focus on helping organizations create a culture, a sustainable culture, uh, and that has a lot to do with driving safety forward. So a lot lot of my business is safety, and my largest market out there is construction. So your largest market is construction, and guess what has a really high safety hazard is, uh, hazards would be construction, right? Number one, uh, 24% of every fatality in the workplace on planet Earth is construction. Is it really? Really? Oh, my goodness. I had no idea that the numbers were that high. So today we're going to talk about safety and how that relates to mental health. we got a high suicide rate in this industry as well. You know, 
So let, let, why don't we start off with this? You know, you, you, you mentioned that psychology meets anthropology for non-academics. Right. What can we expect from today's conversation? We're going to talk about people, uh, who people really are and why they do the things that they do, and that they're consistently historically affected by the same things. So uh, if we're honest about who people are and what we need to be able to effectively manage those people in a way that they're going to have the best mental health possible that's possible and can do the best job that's possible, uh, then there's specific things that we have to do. So we know people. Uh, we know some basic psychology about how to deal with people and treat people. The key is actually doing that. So, yeah, I mean, so safety is clearly a hot topic, right? That yeah. we believe everybody can agree on, to, can agree on, or right. is it a topic that everybody agrees on or doesn't agree on? And do yeah. the leaders in our sector value safety enough to actually make it a priority? I think that they do. I think that they do value safety. I think the old days of we're going to peel back the, the safety and raise our productivity. We now know when you see statistically, I look at a lot of data where people are the most productive. We often see the highest safety record. So the, the myth that we can somehow peel back that safety, be more productive, that's kind of gone, I think. But what do we have to do to do it? In other words, are we willing to, to be the kind of engaging leaders that create a safer culture? When people uh, feel that they're not valued, uh, they feel that their direct supervisor doesn't support them, especially, uh, they emotionally check out on the job. And we know that's psychology 101. But when that happens, when people mostly check out, they're distracted, uh, their level of situational awareness goes down, they're simply more likely to have an incident. And that's what's happening. And, and so, I mean, but with that, though, I mean, we know it's dangerous on construction sites. Right. We right. understand all of that. What's stopping our leaders or the people, the managers or the project managers or the safety managers on these right. sites from, from making it safer? Is it a psychological shift? Is it a cultural shift? Well, it's, it's two things. Number one is they're overwhelmed. I think today to be a leader, there's a lot going on. You have a lot on your dashboard. There's more. We would love to say that technology has helped leaders manage situations better. If you talk to the average person anonymously, they'd said there's just more to look at. They're a little bit distracted. They actually have a harder time focusing on people sometimes because of the technology or because of the requirements they have. Uh, a lot of organizations had people that were more administrative that took care of some things that now leaders take care of themselves. So it may be harder to be a leader. So I'm going to, in the defense of leaders, I'll say that. But a lot of people are simply unwilling uh, to be accountable. And what I mean by that is if you really want to hold people accountable for safety, yeah. uh, you have to hold yourself accountable in front of them first. Here's what I'm going to do differently as the leader. What are you going to do? So, so post incident, uh, okay, we had an incident, trouble, problem. Uh, you know, you screwed up, I guess. Here's what I'm going to do differently. What are you going to do differently? A lot of times leaders aren't willing to say that they're not willing to take responsibility. So that's what, what, I what, if, what if leaders have been doing it wrong the whole time and they think it's right? it's right. Well, that's true. There are a lot of people that that's what they believe. They just don't understand. Uh, the days of assholeism are over. What I mean by that is, is that there used to be an old saying, people don't have to like me. They just have to respect me. Guess yeah. what? People no longer respect people they don't like. That's done. So only on TV shows like House, where there's the jerk who's somehow so valuable that, you know, he can't be replaced as a leader. None of that's true anymore. So. So let's talk about the companies that are embracing safety. You know, what are the influential yeah. leaders doing differently than others? And, you know, what can we learn from them? Can can you maybe share some success stories? Yeah. I will. And um, I, I think that naming specific companies may be unfair, but I can tell you that there are companies out there that have very good safety records. They have high levels of engagement and those two things are directly connected. Uh, they have high levels of retention and they're simply outperforming those around them. They're able to find the employees, keep the employees, keep them safer. But what are they doing? The number one thing they're doing is they're definitely focused on what flies out of their mouth. What comes out of the direct supervisor's mouth on the job site is the culture, not what they think or believe or what the banner says. And these companies are very focused on making sure those frontline supervisors and foremen and people on the job site not only believe, but what comes out of their mouth proves that they actually believe that. And they're highly focused on that. So uh, the best safety program in the world, by the way, are the ones people will follow. And they tend to follow the ones that are supported by the direct supervisor. So the companies that focus on that, by far the most successful, uh, again, 
you don't have to have the most modernized, fantastic safety program uh, to have the best safety record. It's about what your focus is. You know, culture is such a big thing. We talk about it on the show all the time. We talk about, you know, uh, our travels around the world and going to all these manufacturing facilities like yourself. And the most successful companies that we have seen in our construction industry have the most awesome cultures. And and it's go hand in hand. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You can feel it. I just did a big construction event for Skanska. Uh, in Seattle uh, last week, we had about 1,600 people there in the audience. It was an right. outdoor event. It was right at the construction site. They're adding about 7 million square feet to a big industrial compound. Uh, and you could walk out there and you could feel it in the air that these people were well managed. They had buy-in. They were on board. You could just smell it. And you, and it, you I've walked into uh, organizations where I didn't feel that. Yeah. yeah. You, can, you can feel leadership. It's palpable. Yeah. You can feel it. And you can feel it all the way down to the person that's sweeping the floor. Yeah, that's you know? right. Exactly right. Yeah. And that that's what's so incredible about having having that culture in place. So, I mean, really, I, you're talking about safety and employee retention. Sounds like they're related when I hear you talk like this. And we talk about how yeah, yeah. Out of the manager's mouth to the actual uh, team member that they're speaking to. Right. Could I expect less people to quit on me if my supervisors are saying the right things? Yes, you can. And, and that's so important because in the last 50 months, more people have quit their jobs than in the history of recorded data. People are quitting their jobs left and right. It's, it's nothing like it. And so the companies that are willing to, to, to speak to their people and make them feel valuable and create their culture engagement, they are the ones with the retention. Not every, Let's put it this way. Most people will say they're having a hard time finding and keeping employees. Absolutely we are finding companies that aren't having that problem. And the solution is the way they're talking to people. What does it feel like to, what does it feel like to work there? What is it, what is it, if you're the leader, what does it feel like to have you as a boss? Yeah. What does it feel like to have you as the supervisor? That's, that's, people don't quit uh, companies and cultures. They quit people mostly, according to uh, anonymous employee surveys. Yeah. Makes sense for sure. Yeah. What are some of the, the mistakes or misconceptions around safety that that we can all learn from? Well, one of the things about complacency, you know, uh, complacency really, uh, the opposite of complacency is humility. Nobody is such an expert, they can't be hurt. Uh, uh, You know, the guy that invented uh, dynamite, uh, the two brothers, uh, the Nobel brothers, they invented dynamite and the Nobel Peace Prize, same dudes. Um, One of those guys uh, uh, who died, he died in a dynamite explosion trying to invent safer dynamite. He was literally the inventor of what killed him. And we have this idea that somehow expertise, somehow experience uh, makes us immune. And it's just not true a bit. We find that when people are injured, it's all over the place. The average age for an injury in construction is 38.3 years old. It's not the youngest people or the oldest people. And though older people are more likely to die in an incident, uh, according to the research that we've seen, uh, they don't necessarily have the most incidents. But what we couldn't find is that somehow years of expertise and particular knowledge in an area made you safer. Does that make sense? I kind of went a long way to say that. But uh, so it's it's about are you a double checker? Are you willing to take a, a, a second look at it? Complacency is an interesting thing because a lot of times we have modern tools and safeguards and sometimes sometimes we are so enamored with all the safety options we have, we forget to use them. Possessing things that make you safe and using them are, are not the same thing. Here's an example. So years ago, my ex-wife took out the entire garage door in a house I still seemingly own from inside the garage. And, and my question was, is how fast are you going inside a garage? I mean, she yeah. took the whole door out. And I said, there half the dashboard of the SUV is, is, a, is a camera looking backwards, you know? And she says, well, the camera's so big, I don't notice it. I'm like, what? I mean, she, my ex-wife is smart, smart enough to get rid of me, smart. <laughs> Sometimes we possess the tech, we possess, it's kind of like having gloves and not wearing them. It's like having the safety glasses around your neck or on your, you, you, since you possess it, you don't use it. So complacency a lot is about the fact, since I think that I have it, I don't use it. But secondly, complacency is often about emotionally checking out. I'm going to jump into the, the emotional part. Yeah. If, if you feel emotionally that uh, you're not respected, 
that you're not valued. Or we'll jump to social media. In modern times, people look through social media and they tend to judge their insides by other people's outsides. I'm going to judge how I feel by the way others look. That can also cause people to disconnect or check out emotionally. When they do that and they feel that way, what happens uh, is that their situational awareness drops. They simply are not paying as much. They're simply distracted by their own emotions. And that's a direct connection between mental health uh, and having an incident. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you an experience of mine as a kid growing up. And I think this translates back. You know, I was framing houses and I stepped on I stepped on a four by four piece of board at the end of right, it right. And, and went right through the middle, right down to the basement. Right. And I was looked at and they said, bring that GD board back up here. You know, like it was it was that kind of culture. <laughs> right. It wasn't. Are oh, you yeah. OK? You know, because I got up already. Right. It wasn't any of that. But I could understand, you know, you kind of feel deflated. And I'm sure, you oh, know, right. it, it it happens everywhere, right? It, and I, it does. And I mean, I remember being on the job site when I was in the instrumentation business and I heard this older manager say to a younger employee, you know, and this was years ago, say, you young people, you don't know what it's like to work hard. You know, you have a bunch of fancy equipment now. You got special clothing. We got down there naked with a hammer and fixed it because we were men. Like, what? This guy got down there. You were naked with a hammer? What? This yeah, guy yeah. just wanted this young person to know, I don't know, how much braver and tougher they were. What's that about? And, and I think sometimes that's still happening. Yeah, it's still yeah. happening. So do you think it's generational? You know, is the old guard mentally, right. you know, kind of still stuck and unwilling to change? Right. Well, you know, Dave, um, something I can't deliver all the time in a, in a keynote presentation that we can talk about now when it comes to generations yeah. is this. Now I do some stuff that's very generationally focused and I focus on generational safety, but sometimes it's tough to talk about this. So um, it, it, we do things differently as parents or as a group of older people for the next generation. So the number one impact of a generation is the generation before it. And my generation had an idea. Uh, it was bulldozer parenting. And I'm going to clear the path and make sure that people don't have a chance to fail. I'm going to position them to succeed no matter what. And I don't allow them to fail. And what happens if you deal with young people as kids, five or six, seven years old, and you don't allow them to fail and learn from their own mistakes, they lack resiliency. Mm -hmm. And when people lack resilience, they don't bounce back very well. The side effects from that psychologically are they feel persecuted and uh, they uh, feel uh, they are very sensitive to what's being said to them, uh, and they don't bounce back from the failures that they have, and that can also lead to depression. So that's kind of psychology 104 there about what happens. So generations have always had issues, uh, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with these people that are 22 to 32. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that group of people. Uh, there are some issues we can talk about, but it's really how we manage them. We raise them a certain way, and now we have to deal with them for who they are, not who we wish they were. The worst leadership strategy on earth is wishing people were like you. That's never worked. So we have to deal with them for who they are. That means we got to tell them why we're doing it, uh, what a good job looks like when it's finished, not just the JSA or the, the, just the steps. Yeah. Uh, you know, And we have to be extraordinarily clear and, and let them know the sense of urgency. You know, people aren't born knowing a sense of urgency. So the, the leaders who are willing to do that and manage people for who they are, they have great success and great retention, not just great safety records, but people aren't quitting so much. Sure. So so where where are all of these young people? You know, we've talked about uh, how to manage uh, the next yeah. generation, but you know, like, where are they? Are they working somewhere else? Or are they just not going to work? Are they still in mom and dad's basement at 25 years old? Well, well. Right now, 47% of everybody age 32 to 22 to 32 are not looking for a full-time job. So they don't exist in the job market. 52% uh, of them live at home with their parents. That's the most since the Great Depression. So yeah, they're not there. Uh, they want a part-time job or they're not looking. Uh, if you go at two o'clock in the afternoon to any coffee shop, any Starbucks in any city in the United States, it's just packed full of people that are 26 years old. Uh, they have a laptop, a credit card, uh, and an iPhone. They don't need a job and they can live at home. So that's a drastic difference. Yeah. So because of that, because of that, um, we know these people exist. We have to make the job environment a place they want to work. 
And also, we have to let people know that safety is a real thing. Uh, Gen uh, Z and half of Gen Z is in middle school. Gen Z is 12 to 24. Gen Z was not taught to manage danger. They believe an industrial job automatically is too dangerous, and they'll take a, a job paying less money at the mall rather than a job paying uh, more money in construction. That's for sure. And a lot of people whose parents are in construction are not going into construction. They feel the same way. So I think I think we don't really express or verbalize uh, how safe the job can be and how we have so much control of our own safety. It's not like, you know, we have control of our destiny as far as safety is concerned. We know that because there's a, all, every <laughs> every location amongst 10 locations has that fantastic safety record in every industry, no matter what's happened. So we so see it. What advice do you give companies that are looking to hire people that aren't at the coffee shop? Because construction is right. a very hands-on job. So yeah. two afternoons at the coffee shop, your laptop and your phone is not going right. to work for, for our world. That's exactly right. Well, the number one, I'd go to small towns. If you're looking in towns that have under 45,000 people, those yeah. people are more likely to move and relocate for a job because they're in a small town with nothing going on. That's the truth. Uh, people in small towns often are more like the generation before them. So they may not have some of the characteristics that make some of these people hard to hire and hard to manage. So uh, the people that we've talked to are very successful are going to small towns. The other thing is, is they've got these uh, automated systems that you can use to identify resumes. And we find it's not working very well. I'm not saying this it doesn't work for everybody. I'm saying that a lot of people said since we got rid of the automated thing and start actually physically looking at resumes, that we're more successful. But the final thing, especially with people under age 30, is they're the most literal generation that's ever existed. So if you're asking for two years experience and they have one year's experience, they're yeah. not going to send the resume. So that's huge. So got it. So when you say the, the 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 resume checkers that are out there, like the online resume checkers that right. try to make that perfect fit for somebody. Yeah, there, there, there's a, the problem is, is that they're kicking out good candidates. And because you run into situations where people say, we can't find anybody in Lansing, right. Michigan. And they go, we can't find a job in Lansing, Michigan. What's happening? Well, they go and look at it and find out that the software is eliminating people who are looking for the jobs. I'm not saying that there's something wrong with all this software. I'm saying I'm hearing that from some HR folks when they stop the automated and sort of went back to looking through resumes, they improve the job search. So maybe that technology is going to get better. Maybe this is just a moment in time. So sure. sure. Well, hey, listen, let's face it, right? A lot of construction folks, you know, super talented with their with their hands right. may not be their best thing. And all of a sudden they get kicked out and lose out an That's opportunity because right. they're submitting when That's they're a right. professional right. person and not, you know, not a not a book writer. So also, um, what happens is there's so much opportunity for young people because their are people need employees so badly that when you're talking to Hunter, who's 25 years old, Hunter, when he's in the job interview with you, is in three other interviews just like yours. And the person that takes the longest to hire them is getting ghosted. So the faster that you can hire people, the better. There's a lot of companies. There are just too many hoops. When I talk to young people, I hear it all the time. It's like, if they love me so much, why do I have a fourth interview? I mean, how, how much could they love me in interview four? What's happening? So, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the old school way of doing it. And then take them out to right. dinner with the team and see if they still fit right. in and offer them the job. Right. That's how it used yeah. to be done. You we know, have to watch and see if they put salt on their food first or whatever that old test was. Remember, if he's salt his tortilla chips, he's out. We're not, yeah. we're not, even, we're not putting up with that. So. So we talked a little bit about psychology and anthropology. You mentioned, right. you know, the bulldozer parent, you know, is kind right. of a trait to avoid. So what trait, should people be embracing? Well, they should be embracing the trait um, of a detectable level of compassion that as a, a, a leader, that people have to know that you care. Yeah. Again, this idea that you can be respected because you're great and you've done great at the job and you, you know, whatever accolades that are, are, are true about you. If you don't have a palpable, detectable level of compassion, younger people read that as, that you don't care enough. They're a lot more sensitive to someone's emotional connection to them than ever before. Now we can, these young people need to suck it up and do what I'm going to do. And you can say all that, but if that's what you think they're going to put a dinosaur stamp on your head and shove you in a hole, you're done. Uh, we have to manage the people that we have. There aren't any more young people. These are them. Right. And so uh, if we're willing 
to show some compassion and to value people in the beginning, not just when they've proved themselves or been there for six months, but I mean, value them in the job interview and value them in the onboarding, onboarding process. And a little thing on the end, if you're willing to have some dedicated mentors, that means when someone comes on board, they can be mentored right away with the same person to, to, to really get them up and going. A lot of people wash out in the onboarding process. And we're noticing the people of dedicated mentors don't have that washout. So let, let's talk about the mentoring. How does that begin? And how does that, how does that work? And how do you implement things like that within your company culture? Okay, now I know not every company can afford to do this or has the resources for this, but if you can, it's important. There is somebody there at the company uh, who is not really very good at doing their job so much. You know who that is. That's that person that's been there for a while. They, they're really knowledgeable and they're actually good at training people. And they're very good with people, but maybe hands on on the job. They're not the best. Maybe they're the worst. Those people are often excellent mentors. They're not really great at doing the job, but they're very good at motivating people to do the job and training a young person to do the job. I would identify those people that you have that are very popular at work. They get along with people. People seek their counsel already. These are already people who are good with people. If you want to have a mentor, they've got to be good with people. Knowledge and been there 40 years is not as valuable as someone who's just good with people and makes them feel comfortable. That's the number one thing about mentors. You know, I, I, I love what you just said, right? Maybe they're not performing at the best of their job, but they are the social light that everybody wants to hang out with, go have drinks, right, and right, whatever right. the case is. And you're saying, you know, repurpose them for the culture, have right. them the culture and give them the training on what the culture is and let them be basically the voice for that right. department or, or what have you and, and, and incentivize them to, Hey, keep doing it. It's right. awesome, you know, versus yeah. Get back to your desk and work. Right. That's right. It, it's but it's way yeah. too common these it's way yeah. too common these days, Dave, to take somebody who has the most knowledge and the most tenure and assume that knowledge and tenure transfers into influence and training. Right. And that's not really true at all. Sometimes the leading expert is the last person that you want involved with that. Uh, you may remember back in the day, Hormel Chili. Uh, made can a lot of canned chili and uh, they decided to do a campaign and they had a leading expert. Uh, they put him in like in a white uh, laboratory suit and he was on live commercials in the early 1970s talking about Hormel chili. Yeah. Uh, but he was not really a people person. He was not really the right person. And what happened on live television was he said this, he said, you know, Hormel chili has the least amount of rodent hair of any chili on the market. That's what he said because he was an expert. So people didn't buy canned chili for 10 years, not any kind of canned chili. You couldn't sell canned chili from 1972 to 1980. Sometimes the expert is absolutely the wrong person. Let's find somebody that has a natural connection to people and uh, is good as to, to train. Maybe, maybe get the expert to help the training person or mentor to deliver the information. But when people come on board, they've got to feel comfortable. Sure. Little, ca little caveat. I understand in the construction world, we got to get the job done on time and right, for sure. Uh, but if we want to keep people and keep a culture, uh, and by the way, people feel valued and cared for, uh, they tend to look out for each other. So that's the safest culture that you can have. People who feel valued tend to value each other, kind of psychology, anthropology 101. Uh, that is created by the feeling people have when they get that job and start that job. Do they start out feeling valuable? They start out in a mentorship that makes them feel confident as they go in. So, you know, just just listening to you, I'm thinking about all these companies out there that have, you know, leadership teams that are just basically tapped out. Right. They're stressed. Yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they don't have enough people working for them. Right. right. They're like, oh, suffering because right. they're just not mentally there because they're stressed about their own lives right. and their own jobs. And, and what I'm what I'm hearing is this is a good time to actually step out, pick the leaders that have the great relationships right. and redefine what their jobs are. Right. And that's going to help start changing the culture and the productivity of the teams that are working beneath them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and, and it can be a tough thing. But, you know, we the mistake is sometimes we pick to be leaders. This is a tough conversation to have. Um, I don't always talk about this in the keynote presentation, uh, but I'll do it here on the show. Uh, sometimes we, we promote people into leadership positions because they were so good at doing a non-leadership job. Yeah. 
That doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, hey, you know, this person's really good at cleaning the pool. Let's make them the lifeguard. No, that's ridiculous. So we might want to, if we're able to take a look at the leaders that we're grooming and succession planning and all that stuff moving forward, we want to make sure that we have leaders that are naturally influential. They're good at building trust. They can clearly explain the value of an idea. Those are the things that are important in leadership. Uh, expertise is great, but if you think it's just expertise, uh, you'll a, a lot of companies, that's their problem. People simply don't want to work there. They yeah. don't want to work for those people. So, yeah. Well, here I am, Garrison. I got a team of 400 employees running a manufacturing facility. I can't get right. people to work. My staff's overstressed and and driving, you know, driving productivity, right. you know, down. Where do I start, man? Like, where where do I start? Do I say, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hire right. Garrison to come in and pump everybody up, get the managers going, or like, where is the starting point for a company that really wants to make some serious change within their organization? Well, it's easy to say that it starts at the top, um, and that's not true. We love it starts at the top. Actually, what's what's coming out of your direct supervisors in the field on the job site? What comes out of that person's mouth who's managing Jimmy swinging a wrench in a ditch, that's the thing. That's what it feels like to work there. And if you're talking about safety, the people directly managing the people are doing the most dangerous job, okay? That's really where safety happens. That's where culture happens. So I, I say the first thing you do is work with your direct supervisors. Uh, mm -hmm. let, let's, let's, let's make our direct supervisors better and more effective leaders and let them know that they are leaders and let those direct supervisors know that sometimes the culture really rides on them. Again, what they're saying in the field, that really is what it's like to work there on that job site. I, I say you start there. And the reason you start there is that that's going to make the most difference the fastest. What's going to make your culture better instantly start with direct supervisors. And after that, you, you want to go to the the, the, the VP team and do all that kind of stuff. And you want to uh, work with the people who are at the lowest levels. That's great. But I would start with direct supervisors. How do, how do we, how do we address mental health? All right. Maybe the mental health already exists within the company garrison, right. you know, and, and people are really struggling and fighting with, you know, just like you said, not being there and, right. and being present. And that's where the safety problems start happening. Right. How, well, how yeah. We what, yeah. Well, well, I'll start with this. The, the, the key to situational awareness is, are you present in the moment? If I'm thinking about what I'm getting ready to do or what I just did, I'm not focused now. Yeah. So people have incidents because it's kind of like when you're playing or watching a, a football game and you notice in the end zone, people drop a lot of passes as they get towards the end of the job. That final phase of the right. job sometimes has the most injuries. And when you, in, in football, and I hate to use sports analogies, but I'm doing one now. When you get there, you know, uh, why are they dropping the ball in the end zone and the 10 yard line? Because they turn around to catch that ball and they're thinking about running. They're thinking about scoring. They're not present in the moment to catch that. They're not securing the ball. The present in the moment is securing the ball. Right. So number one, are you present in the moment? And if you don't feel valued, if you feel overwhelmed, uh, if you are having a, a, a mental health issue, if you're having some depression, automatically you are distracted by your own emotions. You're not present in the moment. You're much more likely to have an incident or near miss. Yeah. But the solution for this is, is in, uh, you know, I'm not a big pie in the sky guy, but I'm a very positive person. So let me say a couple of things. Uh, number one, 91% of what people are worried about is never going to happen. They've done this research. You, you can Google it. For the last 40 years, most of the things we're worried about are not, we're worried about a lot of things that aren't going to happen. And statistically, things work out in the end. If things have not worked out for you, it's probably not the end. And that's the truth. So a lot of the worry that we have is wasted. You want to worry about something, identify a real issue that's really important, prioritize on the most important thing uh, and, and, and focus on that. But the idea that we're going to spend all our time worrying it takes a lot. It it takes a lot less energy to solve a problem than it does to just worry about it all day long. Uh, you know, um, the uh, and, and this idea that everything has to be perfect. We have to be perfect. Per per perfection is the foundation of procrastination. A yeah. lot of people can't get the job done right. because they're trying to be perfect. Uh, statistically, if you want about successful leaders, uh, the action takers, um, the, the geniuses always work for the action takers. Being smart isn't good enough. 
It's just not. Being a genius, not good enough. You have to be willing to take the action. So to, to backtrack here, if we're willing to address the fact that people are having issues, uh, people have interpreted our circumstances uh, as the worst ever. And it's not true. It's mostly social media. The truth is, is we've almost never been safer than we've ever been before. We have lots of food to eat, lots of opportunity. Uh, there's nothing happening that's new. We're going to go to war with China, maybe. We go to war all the time. Pandemic. We have pan this is the 20th pandemic in 500 years. None of this is new. What's new is, 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 is the news out there and the social media telling us that it's brand new. Beware. And I, I don't know if I said this on the last show or not, but there's the reason the news is bad is because you love bad news. There's not a nickel of money in good news. You can't sell Prozac or life insurance of good news. And the news is supposed to be bad because you love it. That's right. People love bad news. So be honest. If you're watching this show today, be honest. If you're out there clicking around the internet and you see a link that says life is good, life is great, would you click that link? No. If it said headless body found in topless bar, click, that's news. Yeah. <laughs> so as leaders, let's be positive and tell people, hey, we have an opportunity. There's a future. Uh, the, we are going through. This is called life, and it's happened before. And we got through it before. Uh, from, a, from the point of anthropology, human beings have a history of overcoming every problem. We're still here. We are still here. Yeah. So. So next next month, we're featuring uh, an author of Titanic Syndrome, Why Companies oh, Say yeah. And how to reinvent your way out of any business disaster. Nadia, who's our guest, uh, talks about the Titanic and that there were binoculars on board, but unfortunately, nobody knew how to use them. The binoculars were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest, uh, but the key to the locker wasn't on board either. Have you seen this happening in companies? You know, where where's the most essential tools uh, there? You know, is, are, are, the, are the tools there and just not being accessed? There are tools that are there that are not being accessed that nobody wants to admit they don't know how to use. That is true. And it is true. Sometimes the tools for the job are so far away from the job site, you can't actually use them. And there's a rule that you got to put the tools back. Well, if the tools are 400 yards away, I'm not going to go get them. I have to put them back. They're all about make sure the tools are put back where they're supposed yeah. to be. They're 400 right. yards away. So the tools have to be near where the job is. There has to be instruction on how to use them and stop scaring people about the tools. I've, I've seen these training programs. Uh, I, I won't name any names. I'll watch a training program. Stop scaring people to death about, about the tool. It's a tool. We're going to train on it. We got a couple of weeks or whatever. You know, they, you know, if the tool is too complicated, stop using it. But let's not scare people to death. But uh, by the way, it is very, very true. The guy in the crow's nest on the Titanic did not have binoculars or even a spyglass. He's just a dude going, hey, what's that? <laughs> yeah, no ships are great. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, and you know, it's right. uh, you're not seeing very far on those. So let's do a couple uh, quick comments and say a couple quick hellos. We're coming up on our time here already. Henry Mickelberg and Ron had a really strong leadership and motivational culture. Very true. Thanks, Henry. Greg Ugaldi past chair of the National Association of Home Builders. So what does Greg say? Greg says, as always, DC Live brings us great stats and info. Today with Garrison Wynn, they certainly grabbed our attention. Thank you. Garrison, he's an interesting guy. If you don't know Greg, you should connect with Greg. Greg uh, was the guy Love that was the president of the United States three times a year on housing. So uh, wow. very influential in the space. And uh, we're always happy that he joins us. So a little Fantastic. extra love. Henry Mickelberg as well. I do love my Henry over there. In France, you get promoted uh, to leadership positions if you're bad enough to get sacked from the previous position. There you go. Thank you. I love I love that. That's great. Ah, oh, facts. Facts. We can see that all through government, can't we? Uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. So many great insights today. Thank you. That's from Kristen Watson. Kristen, thank you as well for uh, joining us today. And there's so many more of you out there. So love it. Thanks so much. All right. Let's keep moving on here. And, and we're going to wrap up in just a second. Sure. So. We talk a lot about data, right? You talk a lot about okay. data. I remember the last right. time you and I were actually uh, on the call, uh, you love data and you talk to all these fortune companies and all these construction companies from right. around the world. What are the stats that, that just continue to shock you? 
The stat that shocks me the most, and you every time you see a organization that's successful in safety, where they have the least amount of recordables, least uh, amount of uh, near misses, uh, great safety record. When you look at their employee surveys, and, and this, this is a basic employee survey, and is do I feel heard or listened to by my direct supervisor? And when those scores are high that I do feel heard and yeah. listened to, they've got the best safety records. When it says I do not feel heard or listened to by my direct supervisor, they have the worst safety records. And it's repeatable industry over and over, manufacturing, mining, oil and gas. There is a direct connection. So what that means is, is as a leader, sometimes you're going to have to let people talk. And it doesn't matter what they say. And it yeah. doesn't matter what your opinion is of what they're saying. If people feel heard and listened to, they trust. And they're more likely to follow procedures. They're more likely to listen. They're more likely to buy into the safety program. Think about the people that yeah. you know listen to you. What influence right. they have over you. It's a big deal. And it's something that anybody can do. Any leader can do it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, listen, do I feel heard or listened to? And, uh, and, and I think that's really powerful. And I think every leader should use those words every day when they wake up in right. the morning. Right. And, and, yeah. and kind of drive by that because you're absolutely right. It makes a big difference. It's just, we get caught up in our, in our own day-to-day -day lives so often right. that we forget the basic things sometimes that cause us all kinds of grief and well, it's minor things sure. that we could we could just well, it's really true. It, we, you know, sometimes we just forget the basics and wonder why the specifics don't work. It, yeah. it happens all the time, you know. Um, sure. But something you just said just reminded me of something. You know, um, when it comes to, to to listening, you know, sometimes people say things that are you don't want to hear. That's true. Or they say crazy, ridiculous things. Uh, sometimes we just may not like or believe in what someone is saying. But when someone feels heard and listened to. Yeah. Literally, the pituitary gland squirts a fluid over the brain that puts that person in an anesthetized state. There's a long neurological explanation for this. I call it being stoned on like. And they will choose this person over that person, sometimes based on no other criteria. That's why people fall in love and get the hots for each other. That's why somebody will stay with the same process, the same safety procedure, the same tool, the same company, the same supervisor forever. So from a neurological aspect, um, just letting people talk and making them feel heard allows you to have more influence over them. So it, as simple as that is, we're not listening because it's politically correct. It's the right thing to do. We're doing it because it works. We're doing it because it has a real effect on people. And it always has this. Maybe our data is new, uh, but this is not new. You can look at stuff written 300 years ago and they're kind of saying similar things about the willingness to let somebody state their argument and just having them be heard for sure. sure. Absolutely. I find that everybody we have on the show, Garrison, uh, the passion about what they do and what they talk about comes from an experience somewhere right. in right. their own lives, you know, and, and I ask that, you know, and I say that to ask this question, was there anybody Garrison in, in your life that made a big impact on, on who you are? Was it a mentor? Was it a teacher? You know, was, was there somebody that really changed the, your course of direction? Well, there's two things in a story I never tell. Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, I got a job working at Pizza Inn. I didn't really quite have the stuff to work at Pizza Hut, so I had to work at Pizza Inn. Um, I decided one day that I would take off my shirt and shoes for reasons unknown. I was a teenager and I decided I would mix, you know, ammonia and bleach together and mop a floor barefooted. Um, my boss at Pizza Inn told me that not only uh, am I fired, but he wasn't sure I was employable. And that's what happened. Uh, and I, what I remembered in that is it, it, it occurred to me that sometimes we just don't know what to do. We think that we know what to do, but we don't know. I had the tools. I had the information. This floor had been mopped before. I, I, I didn't invent the idea of mops or flooring there was information available. And I think after that time, I always said, maybe I, I want to find out. I don't want, I don't want to ever have anybody tell me that I'm unemployable as a person at any job. So yeah. that really, really a lot. That's, you know, that's really what happened. The other thing was, is, and I, I do uh, talk about it more sometimes than others. You know, I was in the 1990 explosion. Uh, we had a lot of fatalities that day um, and we had uh, a lot of injuries. And the guy on the job site uh, who wasn't the smartest person, 
Uh, I wasn't impressed with his knowledge. He couldn't actually walk me through the plant. I was a, an a instrumentation guy, a vendor at the plant when it happened. Uh, but when things went bad as they did, he knew where to run. And it, it made me realize that when it comes to safety, that everybody knows something that you don't. And the minute you think you know it all, wisdom leaves you like that. What's weird is what stays, you know, your intelligence, your skill. It's just the wisdom that leaves. So those are two really important things that, that remind me uh, of, of what, what the next right step should be sometimes. And it reminds me that, that we really do have to, to listen to others uh, and seek the information, um, no matter what our level of expertise. Expertise does not make you uh, impenetrable. It does not make you safe. Yeah, for sure. Garrison, is there anything that we haven't touched on that we should touch on? Well, you know, here's my favorite question. If you know, if you're if you're a leader and you're talking to somebody, the best question you can ask is, hey, is there a question I didn't ask you that you believe that I should have? Okay. Right? Proves you care, gets people to think about what you said. Um, and I, I think that um, I am concerned about managing young people and concerned about this idea that we've created young people that are not fixable. What are these young people going to do? I've got people say, I've got my kids are living at home. They can't get a job. I, I don't understand why my son's not motivated. You hear a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the truth is, is that we have the ability uh, as humans to go through something that changes us. And just keep in mind that in the 1920s, the late 1920s, they talked about these kids that were eight and nine years old as the most spoiled kids ever. They were not going to amount to anything. As they became teenagers in the Depression, uh, they were depressed. Uh, they drank a lot. They screwed around a lot. And uh, these, what's going to, what, who are these people ever going to become? Yeah. And they went to World War II and became the greatest generation. So keep that in mind. You can go back and I mean, every generation gets critiqued uh, every time, no matter. And what did your dad think about you? That's all I'm saying. So, you know. Eh, don't do it. You'll get eaten alive if you go to New York. Oh, that sticks in my head. <laughs> right. yeah, I'm New York City. Doing what? Hell, you're going to get eaten alive. Do not go to New York City. What, what did I do? Right. I but I think that's, that. I, I think that we, uh, we need young people to come to work. And if you're a young person out there working, we need you. You're the future. You may not look like it from here, but you, in fact, are the future. Uh, and we we want you and we need you. And we are willing. We are willing uh, to deal with yeah. you for who you are, not who we wish that you were. Uh, and we 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 know how to make things safer than they've ever been before. The truth is we've never been safer than we are today. If you take a look over a 10 year period, compare it to the past. Uh, we've come leaps and bounds. So it's, it's, it, it, the, the construction industry is a great industry to be in. There's opportunities, a chance to learn. Things change every day. There's excitement. It's cool. I was just on the just job site last week. It's just so cool uh, to let people know that this is an opportunity and a big one. Yeah, for sure. Well, listen, I mean, you're a road warrior with this message. I mean, you've been speaking yeah. all around the world with some of the biggest construction companies in the world. You know, you've worked with some of the biggest business influencers like Stephen Covey, right? I love Stephen Covey. Back in the day, yeah. You know, if we're to wrap this up, you know, who do you wish would hear this message? Academics, government officials, maybe students in the middle schools and high schools. Who, who do you think this message should resonate the most to? I think that if you are in your early to mid 50s, that um, statistically, you're not really thrilled with people who are 25 and 26 and 27. Um, and that may be detectable. They may, people that age who are going to work for you may feel it. They may sense an automatic built-in level of prejudice you have against them, what you think about them. And if that's palpable, they're not going to want to work for you. So if you want to keep and attract employees, have the culture that believes in the young people. And remember, not all young people are the same. We can't lump everybody together. There's always good people and bad people, you know? I mean, if you're a parent, you know, you got four kids. Nobody's got four good kids. You got four kids. One's on your couch smoking weed in your bathroom right now. Nobody's got four good kids. So people aren't perfect. So that's true. But for those who are able to do the job, uh, we want to allow them to come and do the job and create an environment uh, where they want to stay. 
there are ways that we can conduct ourselves as leaders that attract people. The 25 to 26 year olds that work for you now have thousands of social media friends. They're connected to more people than people have ever been connected to before. So what does it feel like to work at your company? That news spreads fast in your local area and affects who you can hire. So treat the people that you have really well. Uh, create that culture that you have now to attract people to you. Garrison, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. This this has been amazing. Um, people get a hold of Garrison. What's the best way to get a hold of Garrison when you want to tell everybody real quick? Uh, yeah, so you can uh, go to garrisonwind.com. That's garrisonwind.com. You can also go to safety and click safety and go direct to safety stuff. Uh, but there's other things on the site as well. But you can go in there. There's a little form you can fill out. You can ask a question. We'll get back with you. And uh, you can send a form in 24 hours a day. We'll be glad to answer any question that you have, whether it's about a speaking engagement or maybe just something you want to know. And if we don't know it, we'll find somebody who does. I got it, man. I even got the arms. I'm ready. Garrison. <laughs> Fantastic. Couldn't be happier. Yeah. Garrison, you're a lot of fun uh, to, to you. talk to. You're, you're, you're a lot of fun to listen to. Um, I think being a comedian in your past life, we'll have to talk about how those stories at some point, but I can imagine sure. uh, it only helped you get to where you are today with the success and being able to motivate people because you do add some humor behind it. So I, uh, I hope I can be like you when I grow up. <laughs> Well, I do like the beard, by the way, and that is real. Not a stick on. That's an actual beard that you've grown. Yeah, right? you, it hurts okay. if you pull on it. It looks good. It looks good. But no, yeah, thank you so much good. for having me on the show. I really believe in what you do, by the way. And uh, you know, I do a lot of these podcasts all the time. And yours is great, by the way. And I love the fact uh, that you are so supportive uh, of the people that you're dealing with. It really helps a lot. So absolutely. Well, Really, really appreciate that. means a lot to us and uh, here at Dave Cooper Live. So, all right, everybody, listen, that is a wrap. Make sure you join us this Wednesday. It ain't over, man. This is Monday. Guess what that means? You got four and a half more days to build it better. You can change the world. Don't wait for Friday. Let's get going today. And we'll see you this Wednesday, 1 p.m. Strucksoft's going to be on. That's right. We're going to be talking about a software that can help change how you build with cold form steel. I'm Dave Cooper. Garrison, hang right there. I'll come back to you after the outro. The rest of you, say thanks to these sponsors, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. What an amazing show. Thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us to continue to bring all of these innovative conversations to all of you out there. Please visit them, see what they have to offer you. And as always, subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring that bell. It would mean the world to us. I'm Dave Cooper. Thanks for watching.